Yeah, this, um, you all know whose work it is more or less, and I know whose work it is more or less. Uh, this came out of the Russian American Science Association contacting the History Center, IEEE History Center, last spring and saying, we're meeting in Washington, and do you have somebody who could talk about Vladimir Zworkin for one of our sessions? And so naturally, I, I got the call. And then somewhat, well, basically coincidentally, I had put in a reminder or request to the fellow who runs a website called, I think it's blackvault.com. You can look this up. It's a, a, the fellow who runs it, I think his original interest was uh, UFOs and the US government and what is the issue with, with uh, you know, the various reports, the blue books and, and sightings and, and so forth, and has this been hidden. So he's been filing Freedom of Information uh, Act requests, FOIAs as they're called, to multiple departments across the US government and getting all sorts of materials. Some of it's redacted. He goes back and he says, no, I think this ought to be unredacted. And he's been very patient and he's been posting it on this website. And then he's begun to add other material, both right up through the current administration and going back into the 1940s. So at one point, he made this announcement that he was going to be doing American scientists, you know, who are often under suspicion, like uh, Robert Oppenheimer um, and various other, you know, suspicious, pointy-headed intellectuals uh, that the FBI has, you know, large files on. So I looked through the list and I thought, geez, you know, these are all pure scientists. There aren't any engineers or applied scientists. And, and I knew that, you know, Zworkin had been under surveillance from the FBI. Albert Abramson, who wrote a very thorough biography, uh, very thoroughly documented, had gotten an earlier FOIA request of, of FBI papers. But I said, well, why don't you go back and ask and see what you can get? And finally, this 1,200-page PDF showed up, which took a while to download, um, even in this era of 5G, uh, 4G. And you go through it, and you go, oh my goodness, you know, uh, the, the issues here um, will we'll spell out a little bit. And I have every bit of sympathy for Vladimir's work in, and at the same time, I want to emphasize, I have any amount of sympathy, you know, for the FBI and their concerns at the same time for reasons that will make themselves clear. Um, so let's go back because it is this issue of, of Zworkin, you know, spent the first 30 years of his life in Mother Russia. It was his country, his homeland. Um, in the uh, town of Murom, uh, east of Moscow, where his father, and apparently his father had brothers. It's doing a little research through um, both you know, Russian websites, because they're all busy embracing Zworkin as one of their own, uh, and Google Books, which has scanned a whole variety of Russian language uh, publications from the late 19th century, early 20th century. And you can begin to cut and paste and do searches in Cyrillic uh, and, and begin to find, you know, there is Igori Zwarikini uh, buildings. I thought that Igor Zwarikin was his father, who was a very successful uh, steamship merchant. I think he was also mayor of Murom at one point, so he was very well connected. And Murom, which is sort of like uh, Binghamton, New York these days, uh, has, you know, kind of fallen on harder times, but they've preserved uh, various, you know, buildings because nothing is there to, to, to uh, move on. So it's on 21, 27, and 31 Krasnoarmiskaya, Red Army Road uh, or Avenue, uh, Murom, is where the, the Zworkins had sort of like in Monopoly, you had houses where you charge rent. Um, and then here is the homestead that, that Zworkin recalled uh, on the mezzanine, on that second level, there was sort of a, a shelf that he could run around and, and have a good time. Um, and, and then the location to it, uh, also if you're into aviation history, the Muromets uh, fighter planes of, of World War II, uh, the guy was also growing up there. But there's where the homestead was, and then they had basically a lawn or a, a, you know, a grassy lot down to the Oka River where Dad's steamship company was operating. 
Um, so, and then up to sort of upper left there is Peasant Square and, and Red Army Avenue. Um, so this is where, you know, Zworkin grew up and, and was doing very well intellectually, uh, qualifying through exams to go to the Technological Institute of Emperor Nicholas I, um, the building there in St. Petersburg, now again called St. Petersburg after a while as Petrograd and, and uh, Leningrad. And, and then this photo, which the original is not in black and white, I want to give full props to uh, the uh, high school student and then college student, Jonathan Yar, who was working for me at the David Sarnoff Library for a couple of summers. And he colorized it, made sure the tie was red for, for the Russians. And this has begun to circulate around the internet as well. And I just want to make sure you, you remember, uh, give full credit to the, the young man who did it. Um, so inside the institute, you know, to get what was the sort of sense of training for uh, applied physics or electrical engineering in the late, um, this would be 1907, 1908. Uh, Zwarikin is 16, 17 years old. You were uniformed because it was expected you were going to go into uh, the, the military or work for, for the government uh, under the Tsar. And you can see the variety of, of tubes and, and a certain amount of electrical equipment along with, with balances and so forth for your physics and, and chemistry classes. And then you had the Russian Revolution, the first Russian Revolution. You, you may not have, have heard about this as much as the one in 1917 or the one in, in 1991. Um, but this is the one that St. Petersburg was, was uh, you know, one of the two centers of the universe in Russia along with Moscow. And Zworkin got caught up in this. I mean, as a young idealistic uh, um, merchant who wasn't a part of the aristocracy, um, you know, the upper middle class, and, and he was concerned with the sort of corruption of the aristocracy, the exploitation of the, the new working classes and the new factories that are, that are bouncing, spreading out in, in the uh, cities of Russia, and got caught up. And if you've ever seen Dr. Zhivago, there's a scene where, um, you know, he and his, his girlfriend are being chased by the, the mounted cavalry uh, troops through the streets. That's what happened to Zwarikin, who ended up in jail uh, for, for three months um, and, and finally got out. But it, it, made, it alienated him as much as Zhivago uh, because, you know, in the FBI file there was one of these statements where he got interviewed and said, yes, you know, he went in there for the reform cause, the, the, you know, not necessarily to overthrow the Tsar and the aristocracy, but to reform Russian uh, society. And then he turned out that the leaders in the, the student groups were just as lazy and corrupt as the people they were, you know, in theory, trying to overthrow or reform. And so, you know, he said, much like uh, Rick in, in, in uh, Casablanca, I'm not sticking my neck out, you know, for no one. I'm, I'm not carrying the torch. So he studied under Boris Rosing, uh, I think the only photo available of him, um, who had been working on this, these issues of, of you know, electrical uh, reception of, of images and converting light into electricity in one form or another. Uh, these techniques went back and predated uh, Paul Nipkow with those spinning discs that we usually assume were the basis for early television. Um, Nipkow or, or Rosing was looking at, all right, we take the light off an image and spin two sets of, of mirrors and send it through a lens to a, a photo cell. And then we're going to use one of these uh, new cathode ray tubes um, to, you know, Deflect the, deflect the signal in relation to the intensity and, and put it on a, a phosphor screen. So he, you know, he still didn't have the electronic camera. We still have electromechanical pickup of, of, of light, but it is this sort of electrical transmission of largely uh, still images. And there were others at the same time. This is Max Diekmann um, in Germany who, you know, could spell out uh, brown tubes there and PhD, and you can see the Bierstein uh, in the upper right. Uh, so the Germans always have a slight sense of humor. But they're also using this deflection of, of electron rays 
with you know two sets of, of electromagnets to uh, spell out that image and and uh, so forth. Diekman is also known as the other co-inventor of the image dissector along with Philo Farnsworth. Uh, Diekman also developed it in, in the 1920s and then abandoned it as, as uh, practically impractical. Um, so, you know, just as Rosing was doing that, there's this fellow named Alan Archer Campbell Swinton um, in England who had become head of the Röntgen Society, the guy who developed X-rays, you know, again using these so-called mysterious cathode rays, um, where he was suggesting, well, you could get, you know, a, a cathode ray to say basically reverse the principle of a cathode ray tube as a display. You can change the direction and, and get the light back in and, and switch it into electrical uh, programs. And this stuff wasn't hidden. I mean, uh, Zworkin and Rosing and anybody who's working in this field is getting subscriptions in, in the uh, Russian universities, the German universities, American universities and companies. They're seeing this material um, and, and the popular press, uh, you know, is also, you know, the electrical experimenters are going to pick this up and, and sort of popularize it for broader audiences. So none of this is, is really secret. Um, and you get to the point where Zworkin, in the second revolution, having gone through uh, World War I, where he joined the Tsar's army, worked in a, a radio corps, um, ended up you know, disagreeing with superiors occasionally, uh, did his part, got discharged in the middle of the chaos of, of 1917, 1918, and came to the United States, went back to Russia. You know, he sort of flip-flopped a couple of times because he was supporting the uh, white Russians, um, you know, basically the Russians who were opposed to the Red Revolution. They wanted a white revolution of, you know, sort of the uh, aristocratic reformers, and ultimately ended up staying and, and landing at Westinghouse. And it's in this time when, you know, David Sarnoff is the rising vice presidential uh, star at, at RCA, which is cross-licensing with Westinghouse for its radio patents and facsimile and, and possibly television. Anything that's electronic communications and information, um, Sarnoff has an interest in. And so, you know, he's looking in the middle of the 20s at the notion of, of television in one form or another. And, and so was Zworkin, you know, trying to pick up on Rosing's idea. Um, in the 1920s at Westinghouse, he did get permission to develop his electronic uh, television system in 1924, 1925. There are Westinghouse uh, technical reports where he documents the developments and, and did this demo, you know, privately inside the corporation. Um, it didn't work very well. The executives were, you know, sort of teed off at the amount of time and expense that this guy with a really heavy Russian accent had, had presented with them. And he was assigned, you know, go do something more useful. So he went back and got his, his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh um, working on, on photo cells for like uh, motion picture film and, and facsimile. But again, anything that's going to deal with a photoelectric effect is going to come in handy uh, for electronic television. By the end of the 20s, he'd also been working on refining a brighter, you know, higher contrast, higher dynamic range, you might say, uh, cathode ray tube with that, that silvered surface to reflect the electrons onto the, the faceplate. And, and that tube, or one of its brothers or sisters, is at the College of New Jersey Sarnoff Collection uh, today. So here he is demonstrating it in a converted uh, radio set console, and I'm half expecting one of you to say, oh yeah, that's a Westinghouse, whatchamacallit, radio, and they've just taken out the inside and put the picture tube vertically in it because of the, the long neck, the, the small deflection they have to give it that, that mirrored reflection out. And this is in the hallway at East Pittsburgh um, in, in Westinghouse with this... Uh, young woman admiring, if you look at the close-up of it, there's a big W. It's the W of Westing, you know, Group W uh, Westinghouse uh, picture on it. 
And he got written up in, in radio engineering there in, in December 1929, gave a presentation to the Institute of Radio Engineers. There's, there's the W. Um, and it's at that time where you know, Sarnoff has been watching these NIPCOW disk uh, demonstrations. AT&T had been doing sort of giant neon tubes and, and uh, you know, for a sort of electromagnetic display and very sophisticated sort of uh, electromechanical imagers with you know, $250,000 spent. And other people were refining this idea that you could have a perforated screen that, that John Logie Baird in England first reduced to practice, but the patent had expired. Uh, Nipkow was a graduate student in Berlin in the 1880s when he, he came up with the uh, approach. And so Ernst Alexanderson at General Electric, who is known for those giant alternators you see pictures of at the uh, New Brunswick Marconi station and at Radio Central in Long Island, out in Japan, in Hawaii, in Sweden is the one that still operates uh, once a year. Um, he was you know, a brilliant engineer coming from a background of electromechanical engineering. Um, and so his approach was, this is the technique that works. Let's refine it for, I think that's a 30-line image of Felix the Cat. And RCA, NBC, working with GE, you know, had these sort of demos from, from New York City. Uh, Alexanderson had set up programs in uh, Schenectady uh, doing the first um, drama on television, The Queen's Messenger. And you can see the size of the disc to get that rather you know, small two-inch picture that might fit on your, your cell phone with 60 lines resolution as opposed to the, the thousand or whatever Apple puts on, it, on its smartphones. So Zworkin, as RCA becomes uh, the full company that we know, during the 1920s, it couldn't manufacture anything. It was purely a marketing uh, company, distribution company, a, a patent holding company. And Westinghouse and GE both made uh, radios for RCA. In 1929-1930, uh, Sarnoff more or less masterminded the acquisition of Victor Talking Machine Company in Camden and then getting the research staffs uh, relevant research staffs in, in uh, electronics from these two so-called parent companies of RCA who then had to make the trek to depressing Camden. Camden has always been depressing from everything I've, I've read from people that, that had to move there. Um, and so Zworkin is now faced with, he has this you know, technically sweet approach and he's got to fight the guy who says, I've already got something working. And, and so how are you going to do this? And he had promised Sarnoff, you know, I can do television in you know, two years from 1929 for $100,000. And that's how you, he'd learned after the Westinghouse experience, always tell people no more than two years. If, if you're sending out to VC investors, you tell them two years and $5 million or $10 million, And then you show them just enough to keep them going. It's like luring a fish. Um, you know, don't say it's going to take 10 years and $100 million because you, you've just lost the battle. But all you want to do is get that camel's nose under the tent and, and go running. So in 1930, um, this was Zworkin's first notebook for, for RCA Victor uh, starting on, I think, April 3rd, 1930. Before then, he'd been out in, in East Pittsburgh at Westinghouse. And, and there's page one, new design of a cathode ray transmitting tube which means a camera tube um, with multiple anodes and electrode accumulators. So it's this issue, again, of storing charge um, between the, the uh, frame scans. You know, if you're doing this 30 times a second, 29 out of 30 times, the stuff is just sitting there and you want the light to continue to accumulate and build up the electric charge to give you a, a sufficient signal. So, and here's the uh, disclosure because, again, the issue was how are you going to keep those charges on a plate from migrating? You have a picture and lights coming on and sort of triggering electrons, and the electrons are beginning to bleed. You want them insulated, each little pixel to be, you know, stay in place before you scan it. And this guy, Sanford Essig, who was sort of the technician in the group, um, here's his patent disclosure uh, from December 1931. 
uh, witnessed, <laughs> curiously, I guess maybe Essig is German, so it's January 12th, 1931, as opposed to December 1st, 1931. And then Harley Iams, who was the very sharp electrical engineer working with him on August 20th, uh, you know, uh, attesting to, again, how are you going to make that uh, photoelectric plate where everything stays in place? And it was sort of this accident of serendipitous accident where they didn't expect to do it that time, but when it happened, they recognized it for what it was. So you have this plate, and then you need a really clean vacuum, you know, because anything inside it in terms of uh, molecules or atoms sort of floating around are going to interfere with the motion or the movement of the electrons. And so here's your, your exhaust system uh, in Camden with the hood, you know, that you're going to bake this under, and you can see the, uh, the plate under it. And here is uh, Zworkin in, in, I believe, 1933, when they were just beginning to demonstrate this. Um, you know, there's a still photograph of him and, and the, the screenshot from the, the round cathode ray tube. And you can see how the lapel, you know, are sort of bent out of shape and you've got a nice grayscale and so forth. So they were doing a very nice job with this. And that led to publication. This is in Broadcast News, RCA sort of, uh, publication for the broadcast community, anybody who's buying and using RCA radio station equipment uh, gets this magazine. But he also published in uh, proceedings of the Institute of Radio Engineers in the United States, the uh, Institute of Electrical Engineers in England, and I think there was a version published in Germany. Once they got the patent for this, it's like, this is the splash. We finally cracked the barrier into getting a, uh, an electronic uh, you know, sensor for, for imagers. The beginning of you know, what you call modern, modern video uh, cameras. Um, now, you notice they still have him holding the picture tube, not, not the iconoscope uh, there. So Zworkin, in the course of going on the European tour to talk about this, because it's all good for RCA, it's the first sort of major RCA innovation in radio consumer technologies as opposed to long distance communications. Um, they're really touting this, they're really looking forward to the patent revenues of, of making people make that transition or addition of television stations to radio stations. And he thought, well, you know, he's been in touch with some of his old Russian colleagues from graduate school and the 19 teens and uh, gets this sort of response back. Um, this is from a fellow named Lutov. There was also Alex Shorin, um, a variety of other people who were very famous uh, physicists. And it's so, uh, dear Vladimir Kuzmich, you know, his middle name. Uh, received your letter from May 8th. Thanks for your attention. We'll be glad to see you in the Union, the Soviet Union. Uh, your visit, highly desirable. Um, we will, you will be presenting, uh, we'll give you the details. Uh, Lutov thought he would be in the USA in July. Uh, if we don't meet during my stay in America, all the details will be given to you by Vartanian, uh, Armenian name. In any case, it's very desirable that you'll bring with you to the Union, televisors, device, and iconoscopes for demonstrations, you know, the little reverse engineering. Now, it does turn out that the Russians did have, I mean, Zworkin was not the only one trying to do um, Alan Archer Campbell's, uh, Campbell Swinton's iconoscope, what he called the iconoscope. Other people were also doing vacuum tube video camera technology, and in fact, the Russians published a photo of one, but apparently it didn't work. And I suspect it was that issue of the, the bleeding, blurry electron plate that they couldn't get images on. So they're very excited to see what he's doing. And here's his itinerary from uh, Zworkin's papers um, where he's traveling. In the middle of it on 310 here is to Muram. He's going to go back to his you know, hometown, as it were. And, and do a little nostalgic visit. I don't remember if he actually got away with that, but uh, that was the, the notion in 1934. Um, and then, you know, he ends up, there are memos within the company. You know, it's not as if he's doing this secretly. 
uh, your conversation with Mr. Grimley, who I've forgotten, he's, I think, within RCA Victor. The development job we have undertaken for the Russians covers modifications to our standard five-tube, two-band receiver, the Model 118. Does that ring any bells? No. Well, go look for it. And substituting the European long wave band, 750 to 2,000 meters for the short wave band, um, ready for, for schedule. Shipment will be made to Russia through Amtorg, and that was their American trading company based in New York, which is also one of their locations for basically collecting as much data legally and illegally as possible from American car companies, American electrical companies, you know, American food processing companies. Basically, I mean, the Russians, you know, have spent most of the 20th century collecting by one means or another technical information from the United States and, and Europe to try to catch up. Is, and you might say the logic, if you were in their position, would you reinvent the wheel or would you steal it? You know, it's a sort of, what, what do you want to do? So at the same time, uh, Zworkin's visit was, was very successful. He gave a variety of lectures and, and the word presumably went up within the Soviet hierarchy. Um, well, maybe we should, you know, uh, talk to, uh, get doctors working to see if we can get a license from RCA to uh, sell us their electronic technologies. Um, and that negotiation went on in the fall of 1935. You can see they're gathered in the boardroom at uh, 30 Rock. Um, there's a framed portrait of, uh, I think that's uh, General Harbord there on, on the wall, and that may be at the Sarnoff collection as well. And Harbert is actually sitting at the end of the table as, as the chief executive. On the right here is, is David Sarnoff in the middle of the 1930s during the Great Depression when RCA has laid off thousands of employees. He's taken pay cuts. The US government is going after RCA for, for patent violations. The company has lost 90% of its record uh, phonograph sales is very stressful time. And so this is where he's looking his least healthy, actually. And between Harvard and Sarnoff are three of the Russian representatives. Um, and I think there were two others in there. Um, above them up here is Otto Scher. He was the patent lawyer, the, the chief uh, vice president of patents and intellectual property for RCA. So there they are, gathered for, I think it was $2.8 million in cash, which the Russians had to pay up in you know, silver or gold um, to the United States, very precious hard currency, um, which they did not do for practically anybody else. They got access to anything that was not classified. So they didn't get RCA's early work in radar but they got an awful lot of everything else in terms of how to make vacuum tubes, how to make radio sets, how to make televisions, how to make record players, um, long distance communications, you know, uh, all the vacuum tube stuff that was cross licensed from GE and Westinghouse went to the Soviet Union in the middle of the 1930s. Now, RCA did go to the federal government and say, you know, geez, is this all right with you? And the Commerce Department signed off on it. Uh, the State Department said, you know, well, we want to be friends. We just recognized Russia, the Soviet Union in 1933. Um, this seems okay. And I haven't quite figured out what the War Department said, um, but they did try to go. It's just I, I got into the archives and got through two out of the big three that would be looking over uh, this sort of international negotiation. So, so there they are in, in the solo uh, photo. And there's the cover page of the agreement uh, as of September 30th, which is, again, the anniversary of David Sarnoff's start at American Marconi in 1906, coincidentally, between the electroweak current, all right, this is like electronics versus electrical power, in the People's Commissariat of Heavy Industry and Radio Corporation. So we have this information from Lauren Jones's uh, collection, which is now at the Hagley Library with uh, Zworkin's papers and all the other materials from the Sarnoff Library. And uh, Jones had gone to Russia in 1928 in RCA's first sort of uh, communications agreement to, to do long distance communications. And he had been you know, studying a bit of Russian the Russians had sent over somewhere between 40 and 50 engineers 
1936, the Americans at RCA entertained them royally with, with parties at the Hotel Walt Whitman. They all wore silly hats. And um, they got to crawl over, you know, uh, various RCA engineers remembered, yeah, they got to, you know, anything they wanted to look at, you know, you paid for it, here it is. You know, ask us questions at NBC, come to the Empire State Building, come to Rockefeller Center, uh, come down to Camden and Harrison, look at, you know, all the stuff we're doing. And then five RCA engineers went over to Russia to help them install some of this equipment, make sure that their new vacuum tube factory uh, was in place, and Jones was put in charge of the television project in Moscow. The Shukov Tower is still a monument um, on one of the hills of, of Moscow. It's made out of uh, railroad uh, rails in 1922, and it was one of the first radio stations of the revolution. And so they were going to wire it now for uh, television broadcasts. And so there's Jones, I think, at the Hotel Metropole with a giant portrait of Stalin um, outside his window. And, and here is the, you know, I think RR36, is it? The um, RCA television with 363 <coughs> lines with the monitor equipment here and another uh, CRT there. And uh, Jones, you know, recorded that he went out to a dacha, one of these cabins out you know, 30 miles outside of Moscow in the middle of the winter of 1937 to, you know, check the reception and walking through deep snow and, and so forth. There aren't any cars on the roads, you know, doing this by sledges or something. And he just said, this was totally cool, you know, not just cold, but it was, it was, it was cool. Um, the other curious thing, of course, was when he got to uh, Russia with his, his four RCA you know, colleagues, they said, where's Dmitri? Where's Mikhail? You know, the guys that came to Camden, we remembered. What had happened? The purges, the Stalin purges of 1937-38, where he wiped out the general staff of his army and uh, took the head of his future rocket program, ended up being dragged away in the middle of the night from his family. Everybody disappeared. Anybody who had had contact with the bourgeois imperialists, they were undoubtedly converted into spies, and they were sent to Siberia, never seen again. And um, so this was like this political turn. When Zworkin went back, he, he visited Russia one or two more times during the 1930s, and you know, there's his sister. You know, his, his, uh, you know, he's got a couple of sisters, and it's like they're so glad to see, uh, you know, their, their beloved brother. And, you know, they'd love to have him come back. You can be sure that all those scientists are saying you can be part of the academy. You know, you will have a top position here uh, building the new mother Russia, which in the 1930s, during the collapse of the capitalist democracy economies, you know, um, it looked like a pretty safe alternative. You know, the propaganda from Russia was very effective, and nobody really knew about the Ukrainian uh, holocaust that, that Stalin was starving people into cannibalism uh, in the Ukraine while collectivizing the, the peasants and so forth. And so this is very tempting. But the brothers-in-law, the husbands of those sisters, said, don't come back. <laughs> Stay away. But you can see the force is strong, right? The lure of the home country is very tough, but he, he you know, went back. And so you know, the US carries on with its own versions of that television. Uh, Zworkin begins to kibitz with uh, George Morton and um, uh, Harley Iams on the next generation image iconoscope, sort of a, an electron multiplier or some way to amplify uh, the signal. Oops, OK. Um, and then also gets into, he's beginning to uh, date. He has an unusual, still unfully explained relationship. He has sort of separate living conditions with his wife. Um, and he's met uh, Dr. Catherine Polovitsky, a medical doctor who has got a position at the University of Pennsylvania across the river from, from Camden. And you know, she's one of the people who's saying, what am I doing? You know, what do I want to do? And she's saying, you should be doing things that can help health, you know, medicine. So the electron microscope, we, we can send things far. Now how can we expand things that are far and, and see them better? You know, magnify the image 10,000 times, 50,000 times, 100,000 times. 
And so he bootstraps this electron microscope project that uh, James Hillier got hired out of uh, University of Toronto Graduate School um, to build. Zworkin basically borrowed $10,000 from another account to pay for the first microscope. And then when the accountants came by, explained you know, that he had sold the new microscope for $10,000 to, uh, I think, American Cyanamid. Um, and basically got RCA into a completely unrelated business that was always sort of a, an orphan child. You know, where do you put electron microscopes in your product category? It ended up in broadcasting, uh, which you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense. So the war came, and uh, here is the ace sniper Lyudmila Pavlichenko uh, visiting Camden in 1942 for a, a war bond raising. Um, this is you know, when Russia has managed to beat back the first offensive of the Germans uh, towards Moscow and uh, moved into Stalingrad. She was one of the great Russian-Soviet snipers of the war. And so you know, Zworkin obviously gets to chat with her in Russian. And I've always, I haven't gotten it clarified whether you know, Sarnoff remembered any Russian from his you know, first nine years uh, growing up in, uh, in Belarus. So the U.S., um, you know, in Zworkin's laboratory, he's now director of the entire electronics laboratory. He's not necessarily directly involved. He's not keeping up with the literature. He's an administrator. He's a big wheel overseeing multiple projects and programs where he's getting the reports, but he's not doing the hands-on uh, sort of work anymore. And he's hired more smart people. Here's three PhDs, Albert Rose, Paul Weimer, and Harold B. Law, working on the image uh, orthicon. You know, the basis for the Emmy is this television pickup tube. Here is the disclosure by Harold B. Law, the guy on the right. Um, and it's out of the engineering notebooks G446 and 655. That means they're government notebooks uh, during World War II. Um, so, this was the technology they were developing for basically the first, you know, you might call them cruise missiles or, or drone, you know, armed drones with a TV video camera that were operated by a joystick. And their sensitivity was between 100 and 1,000 times better or more sensitive than the iconoscope. So here is Ray Kell on the roof of the RCA laboratories, which is just across Route 1 from here. Um, under a full moon, that's what's glow reflecting off of his glasses. You can tell it's, it's Kel because of that distinctive sort of uh, witch's cap there on, on his head. And after World War II, when it's like, OK, it's no longer classified like radar, we can start bragging about it and push this you know, government paid technology into our TV cameras, which any number of, of stations, including NBC, were reluctant to do because the Iconoscope uh, auto share, um, auto shod had improved the technology, cleaned up some of the issues of the iconoscope, and everybody's saying, why do we have to buy new cameras for this? That's going to be expensive. And apparently Sarnoff sort of stepped in and said, you know, bite the bullet and take the cost. So here's one of the uh, little drone uh, missiles with the, you know, iconoscope camera in the front. Maurice Schechter, uh, did a wonderful job formerly with Duart, now running his own little sort of restoration uh, business with, with video tapes and films out on Long Island, uh, did the most to sort of restore a complete chain. And then this was the second generation was, can we reduce that big, long 18-inch tube to about the size of a good Cuban cigar? And, and that's what is in the front here. Now, there were all sorts of other approaches using radio guidance and, and radar guidance that, that this didn't uh, continue uh, continuously. And then here's you know, a pretend attack on uh, the, in southeast Washington, D.C., the Anacostia River flows into the uh, Potomac, and now you could hit the uh, power station. So RCA, you know, it's the war. The Soviets are our allies. They're losing 20 million people in, in, you know, to the German onslaught through uh, both you know, military and civilian casualties, as well as starvation. Uh, devastated basically all of Western Russia down to the Caucasus and to the gates of Moscow. And you know, they're absorbing an awful lot of, of Hitler's you know, onslaught. And so 
the notion with the uh, RCA is like, okay, our original agreement expired back in 1940, 41. Maybe we should renew this after the war. And uh, so here is the proposed one, um, you know, sent to RCA Communications, a former uh, U.S. colonel in the Signal Corps, um, you know, determine whether this provide this agreement, you know, provides with your proof. And that didn't happen. Now, one of the issues is any number of people are becoming more suspicious about the Russians. J. Edgar Hoover had always been suspicious of the Russians. And uh, here in July of 1944 is, you know, notice uh, the Bureau is learning that the Soviet Secret Intelligence uh, Age, uh, Service, NKVD, any of you read Ian Fleming's James Bond, you may remember NKVD, uh, becoming increasingly active in the United States. Investigations to close the Soviet government is exceedingly interested in obtaining information relative to scientific developments in the United States. In connection with efforts being presently made to locate and identify agents of the NKVD and individuals who may be cooperating with them, your attention is uh, called to Vladimir Kosma Zorikin. <laughs> so what's up with uh, Vladimir? And, you know, well, we've got his present address, Battle Road, next to the uh, Institute of Advanced Study. The house is still there. Um, he's been in contact with Ernst uh, Orlando Lawrence, who has been employed on the DSM project at the University of California, Berkeley, at which time he said, uh, Zworkin said, he's collecting technical books in the major scientific fields as the result of an urgent request from Soviet authorities. Never explained, at least I haven't seen going through this, is why couldn't the Soviets just go to a bookstore or the publishers? I mean, these are published books. You could, you could buy your own textbooks, but I guess maybe they were hoping they could get them for free. Uh, money was, was tight. Um, confidential informants at the RCA laboratories at Princeton have advised that Zworkin is independently engaged in research on the DSM project. He is a currently associate director at the labs with a reputed salary of 48K a year, which is really nice money in 1944. Um, one of the national sponsors of the well-known magazine uh, Russia Today, um, and he has allegedly been contacted by Russian consular officials. There is a possibility the subject may accompany a technical message mission from RCA to the Soviet Union in, uh, on Christmas Day, 1944 and is supposed to visit the Soviet Union to receive a decoration. It is requested a stop notice, therefore, be continued for one year's duration. This means, basically, they can collect all his mail, tap his phones, you know, open his mail, reseal it, and send it back. It is desired that particular attention be paid to any information in subject's possession concerning the DSM project or technical developments in the electronics field since he might attempt to transmit such information to the Soviet Union without proper clearance. We really would not like the subject to be arrested or unduly detained or that he become suspected that he, or that he suspect he is being watched. What is the DSM project? Yes. I was going to ask you, is that the, is that the A bomb? Yes. <laughs> it's not the Manhattan Project. The, I've forgotten what the DSM stands for, but that was the, the FBI's code was because Lawrence was the guy doing cyclotrons. He was the Nobel laureate at Cal Berkeley. He didn't end up at Los Alamos, but there was obviously a great deal of communication very close to Oppenheimer. And actually, the more you look at the story of the Manhattan Project and the FBI and General Leslie Groves is you know, trying to supervise these you know, crazy, imaginative, brilliant physicists, is Lawrence was the biggest pain in the butt. I mean, he was the guy that said, I don't care. I like hanging out with my you know, pinko friends in Berkeley. I'm not changing my relationships. I know what I'm doing for the country. I'm not giving them secrets. But, And for somebody like you know, uh, Hoover and these FBI, it's black and white. <laughs> You're either with us or against us, and anything in between, that kind of nuance kind of gets evaporated, and, and you can sort of sympathize with that. So um, here in mid-1940, said T2, one of their informants, a report was written and circulated at the RCA labs by a Mr. Weinberg that it might be well to understand nuclear physics, 
so as to build up patent developments and place RCA in a good position in case this nuclear physics developed to where production was possible. Nothing official was done, however, and I never saw, this was completely, I had no idea, and there's nothing in Zworkin's, you know, we don't have notebooks from the 1940s, um, any evidence of this, this is completely new. Uh, he knows and has observed personally that the subject, Zworkin, uh, chose two associates with whom he is now working on nuclear physics, akin to the DSM project, involving a highly confidential military development. Um, this is unknown even to the RCA directors. Well, the board of directors would never know this sort of level of stuff, and is a closely guarded secret at RCA. Now, George Morton, I mean, one of the things we do know is that fellow George Morton that he was working on smoking the pipe in, um, with the image iconoscope, uh, who Rob Flory has told us through his grandfather, they used to chop up bits of rubber band with the tobacco and, and let him smoke that. Um, he was a very sharp guy who kind of disappears from the labs. Well, he was down at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and as I understand it, they got one of the first electron microscopes. You needed this for your uranium hexafluoride research, all your chemical research, you're going to be using um, this, these very powerful state-of-the-art microscopes. And so that may be what they are working with, and, and I don't know for sure. So it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, development of substitute metals, there you go. Um, and there's Ernst Lawrence hanging out with, I think, Fermi uh, in the middle and the bongo drum on top. And then um, this is Theodore Carr. Ah. He was there. Era, um, the aviation, basically the brilliant German-American av aviation, phys aerodynamics physicist. Carmen. Was that? Carmen, yes, thank you. Theodore von Karman was head of all aviation research, you know, jet-propelled planes, uh, cruise missiles, whatever it was at high speeds. You're, you're moving from prop-driven planes to jet-propelled planes. The aerodynamics and the physics changes completely. And, and Carmen was the most brilliant theorist of all of this uh, working with it, and Zworkin knew him very well. So um, here's another uh, stop notice. Now, so during World War II, the FBI has sent two burly guys in jackets to follow Zworkin wherever he goes from Princeton down to New York down to Washington, D.C. Um, so this is just a clip. The ambassador had not arrived at his office, um, but you know, somebody at the embassy, so the FBI had an informant within the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C., advised that at 12.38 p.m. the subject, Zworkin, tried to reach the ambassador's secretary without success. He stated he was leaving his hotel for the Pentagon building. So if you're in the FBI, and here's like the top electronics guy at the Radio Corporation of America doing all sorts of military contracts and secret research, including this DSM project, and you find out he's calling the Soviet embassy trying to meet with the ambassador, and then when he can't get to him, he says, oh, well, I'll go to the Pentagon, and I'm going to meet there with Theodore von Karman, the head of our aviation you know, research. So at 12.45, seven minutes later, he left the Ritz-Carlton, well, it's the Carlton Hotel. The RCA had the complete top floor of this as their suite for lobbyists and, and technical directors and so forth. Walking south to the Keith Theater at 15th and G, you can recreate this today, uh, Northwest, and he went to see the movie Suspect, starring Charles Lawton. At 310, he watched the whole thing apparently, he was observed leaving and entered People's Drug Store at where he ordered a lunch, okay? Then he left, walked back to the Carlton. Confidential informant advised that at 3.50 that afternoon, he finally contacted Ambassador Gromyko and advised he was leaving on the 5 o'clock train. Could the ambassador tell him anything? The uh, ambassador said no during his stay in Moscow, uh, before and after the Yalta conference, Crimean conference. He had not had time to take up matters with the subject, had, had brought up. What were these matters? You know, he's like, the FBI is like, also he had received no answer from Moscow and did not know reason. Um, but he would then contact, et cetera. The subject assured him there were no changes. Gromyko apologized for not seeing, been very busy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I felt like I was confaged. Okay. Um, so one of their proposals, you know, the FBI saying, how can we get more information about what the heck's working is doing inside the RCA laboratories? Um, and we could get a stenographer, you know, 
somehow replace one of his Russian-speaking stenos with uh, somebody we know who can then get all his information, um, identify his contacts, overhear his conferences and telephone conversations, afford access to confidential files, and follow his relationships with regard to Glavsprom Commission personnel who were to be stationed. These are the Soviet licensing uh, people that, again, had been doing the, uh, the project in the 1930s. And apparently, they're anticipating the new agreement uh, coming up uh, in, in the future. So Zorkin didn't get to go with all the other elite physicists and, and researchers of the United States in that post-war trip to Germany uh, to basically the project paperclip. How can we get out of Germany all the incredible research they've done in civil, mechanical, electronic, chemical uh, engineering, as well as the biomedical research on, on the concentration camp victims that was rather useful when you were beginning to worry about what does happen to people at high speeds underwater when you've you know, got frogmen and so forth doing you know, research. We can't do human research, but we can certainly take advantage of the work that uh, these Nazis did uh, for our benefit for, for the future. So Zworkin is outraged. I mean, he's you know, totally humiliated, uh, thinking you know, he might resign, retire. Uh, you know, Sarnoff has to sort of reassure him, look, you know, I trust you. you know, I can understand Hoover's concern. There you are in the morning going to the Pentagon, in the afternoon going to the embassy. I mean, there were multiple trips like this. In some of the movies, he didn't like. I don't think he liked 30 Minutes Over Tokyo or 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. That one he left fairly shortly. Um, so it was really extremely, you know, I've been a good American. I was doing, I was contacting, as it turns out, all he was trying to do for the American ally during the war was, can we get more blood transfusion equipment for the Red Army? You know, we have lots of equipment. They're, they're dying by the hundreds of thousands on the front there and you know with again his wife and they've got all this information about his contacts and the FBI you know they get your contacts they then see who do your contacts know you know what's the chain of, uh, of, of, of association you know degrees of separation and um, it was all you know perfectly innocent I certainly wasn't going to tell them anything about jet planes or or you know uh, the radiation laboratory because they were also following him up to MIT where the Rad Lab and all the radar research was. And the FBI was like apoplectic that this guy had like special passes at the Pentagon. He could go to any ring he wanted within the Pentagon. At the radiation lab, he had a special pass. Could see anybody he wanted in all those projects. This $2 billion radar project. He's working on this DSM stuff, you know. It's, it's driving them crazy, and yet Zworkin is thinking, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is acting as you know, both a good patriotic American and a good assistant to the country I know best, or know well. So in the 1950s, he's you know, getting close to the sort of enforced age of retirement and um, taking up other projects, like self-driving cars. This is the, the first iteration. Um, and I think this might, yeah, this would be at the RCA laboratory somewhere with that curtain. Never found that car. Don't know what happened to the car. Um, but it ended up being, uh, you can look at Google Earth or, or Google you know, satellite views and see part of this racetrack is still behind the RCA labs or SRI uh, labs. It's now part of the soccer fields. Um, here's Les Flory hanging out, you know, this thing has got all these sensors implanted in the ra on the, the road track here, and it basically controls through feedback. Did you ever find that 58 Chevy? Yeah. <laughs> Ask Rob. <laughs> um, so in 1956, you know, somebody thought, geez, you know, the FBI is still doing its due diligence on, on Soviet nationals, and they're collecting photographs. And one of them might be identical with this very, you know, subject of great interest named Koch. The subject refused to be re-interviewed for this purpose. He had left Russia to get away from the state police, and he didn't want to be bothered. <laughs> um, you know, you didn't do me any favors. I'm not doing you any. 
So he kept going. Um, one of his other projects was, again, this is sort of the uh, influence of, of his now uh, new wife, um, you know, medical, medical research. So here is, in his you know, handwriting, uh, 1956, a radio pill, sort of the world's smallest radio station, uh, something, you know, a little bigger than a good and plenty pill, but you could swallow it with some effort. And it had a pressure diaphragm, an FM oscillator, a battery, and a cap. They're still making these now. They now have video cameras inside them, and they go down your digestive tract and do a lot more information thanks to you know, various principles of Moore's law. But Zworkin was the one who demonstrated this on himself. There he is. He's, he's swallowed it, uh, working with a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, now we're you know, sort of watching it go down through your duodenum uh, here. They didn't end up commercializing it, but uh, I think it was Rob Flory uh, arranged to donate the surviving pill. I don't know if it was Zorkin's pill. Don't want to know where it's been, but that also is at the Sarnoff collection. <laughs> so, you know, Zorkin is sort of a, a person not above suspicion. He's always in suspicion. So another you know, informant advised in 1959 that uh, he had traveled there. Uh, he was furnished with an interpreter whose name has been blanked out, subject to the Ministry of Health, again, medical issues. Um, it was curtailed because Zworkin fell from a boat on the Volga River and broke his leg. Um, and then you know, he was with, in contact with an old Soviet friend of his name, Peter Kapitsa. Uh, he's a famous physician in Russia. Anybody know who Kapitsa is? Actually, a famous physicist in very famous physicist. This is the other thing. It's like the, the, the FBI is clueless about, oh, subject observed going into the National Academy. And they have no idea what the National Academy of Sciences is in, in, uh, in DC. Um, met with his brother and three sisters in Leningrad on September 23rd. Um, Zworkin was in the FBI. So they're still collecting all these contacts. But ultimately, you know, at the point where Zworkin is 78 years old, let's see, 67 plus 11. Yeah, he's 78 years old. Newark office of the FBI does not feel additional investigation is warranted. His advancing age and retirement from active, active work have undoubtedly diminished his attractiveness to the Soviets, particularly from a long range standpoint. Um, and you know, the investigation conducted back in 1944 and 45 was both intense and thorough, but did not result in any you know, damning evidence of, of you know, suspect uh, loyalty. And so that's the end of the story. Uh, Zworkin kept going. But you know, as I told the Russians back in November when I presented this to a whole bunch of Russian emigres in a you know, environment today where we have very tense relationships with, with this other great power. Um, one of them came up to me and said, very modern, <laughs> this whole presentation is like, you know, what is the NSA doing with the Russian Americans who are you know, chairs of departments at North Carolina Chapel Hill? They're involved with you know, uh, linear accelerators, high quality particle physics. I mean, they're very successful people. And while I was there, um, the ambassador to the United States of, of the Russia came. I ended up shaking his hand. And uh, he spoke before I got to speak, along with the head of technical uh, investment in Moscow region. Uh, Moscow is expanding like, say, the city of Shanghai. They've got 20 subway lines. They're expanding in every direction. These two people were saying, you're always welcome. Come back to Russia. Help us out. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of resources. We can you know, do all of this. So the temptation, or at least the effort to lure people, is always there. Now, whether you actually decide you know, um, you know, the, the two in the hand or one in the hand is worth two in the bush. Um, but this is the, these issues of divided loyalties or suspected loyalties unfortunately never go away with people who are extremely productive uh, for, for the United States. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you and invite any questions.